it's not just one central bank buying gold. It's one central bank not buying gold, and that's the U.S. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Hi there, my name is Shane Moran, and I'll be your host for this week's episode of Live from the Vault, and welcome to the show that goes beyond the headlines and uncovers the truth about the precious metals industry and the effects on the global economy in these historic times we're living right now. With exclusive access to experts and insiders, we reveal information and insights that you simply won't find anywhere else. Now, this week, we have the one and only Andrew McGuire, precious metals expert and whistleblower in the vault. And to help him pull back the curtain, we'll be joined by popular demand and a good friend of life in the vault, industry expert, Dr. Stephen Lieb. That's right. Dr. Stephen Lieb is in the vault and you're not going to want to miss a moment of this conversation. So just before we introduce our special guest here and before we head over to the UK, uh, please help keep spreading the word and, you know, If you like the channel, hit the like button right now. It really helps the show out and share this information. And also, if you haven't already done so, subscribe. And if you click on that bell right there, uh, you'll be notified in real time as each episode goes live. Now, let me introduce, for those that don't know Stephen, uh, he's a money manager and investment advisor. He's been doing this for over 45 years, a wealth of knowledge. And he's been guiding investors via his newsletter, Intel for Investors, and his books and his blogs and his appearances on financial news networks, including CNN, Fox News, NPR, Bloomberg TV, and also Live from the Vault, just to name a few. So let's head over to the UK and Talking Gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire and our special guest, Dr. Stephen Lieb. Over to you, Andy. Thank you, Shane, for this lovely introduction. And, you know, it is a privilege for me to, uh, and I really do look forward to spending a little time asking our dear, dear friend, Stephen Lieb, who has been with us before and opened my mind to a lot of things um, and uh, everything from spirituality all the way through to um, uh, what uh, basically the, the, the inner workings of the dastardly fed. So welcome, welcome, Stephen. Thank you for joining us again today. Thank you very much, Andy. And I I have to say, um, I mean, I'm a very big believer in gold, obviously, and I think it's inevitable that we join a gold standard. But um, you're the only show I watch, with the possible exception of my own interview with you. I will watch every <laughs> every. Um, you know, every show, I think, you you know, you're really, I just want to compliment you on that. Enough said. I mean, you're, you're terrific. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, but, but Stephen, you come with such a wealth of knowledge and I you know obviously the many books and when people um, visit you on your website um, and I've obviously you've got the link there being put in for you, put, put in for people, but you know, it's pretty clear that, that you have a wealth of knowledge. I mean, I mean, and, and this is why when uh, when we when when you when you you speak about things, and and obviously, then it's anchored in that wealth of knowledge. And I think we we have a cross section of people that are coming in. Some are very 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 well um, uh, uh, versed with what's going on, and, and many are, are really looking for information. And this is all about, to be honest, Stephen, isn't this all about education? and helping people to take responsibility for themselves and make perhaps better decisions based upon more information. Yeah, I think so, Andy. And, you know, especially Americans. I mean, we have stumbled so badly. I mean, no one will believe this. I don't think in a two or three, four hundred years that a country could go from the greatest economy possibly that ever existed uh, in the 50s and 60s to something that is not recognizable. I mean, something that is more readily, literally, I hate to say this, compared to autocratic, the the worst of the autocratic regimes that that you've seen in this century or or, or before. It's, 
it's really hard to believe and you really have to do some digging. That, that That's really how I got to some of this knowledge. I'm trying to write one more book before I go to the next place on my final journey, but whatever. And I'm trying to complete that. And it, it does have to do with a lot of different things that America just lost. It, I, I, I think basically starting with Vietnam and, you know, the assassination of Kennedy, the both Kennedys, and that sort of cleared the way for wars and spending massive amounts of money and the end of the gold standard. I mean, I do not think it's in any way a coincidence. I think it was foretold in retrospect that when we left the gold standard and became free to spend as much money as we wanted, I mean, also the petrodollar, we really replaced the gold standard with the petrodollar. We, we could spend as much money as we want. Materiality took over our existence and that was the end and it's been accelerating. And we're coming up against a, a, a culture right now in China. I have to be careful because people often take me for a China file. I'm not. I, I could not live in China, even if I, well, I have trouble speaking English, much less learning Mandarin. But I could not, even if I knew Mandarin fluently, I, you know, I don't share their culture. I would never feel at ease. I mean, you see these bloggers or YouTubers that, you know, have spent 10 years in China, but they're back in Canada or wherever they once lived because it's hard to be with people whose culture you do not share. And I, I couldn't be there. Uh, I don't particularly like the autocracy there. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff I don't like there, but I do totally respect their culture. And uh, it, it's a spiritual culture. I mean, basically, uh, and, and one thing about spirituality, it, it's, it's, you talk about it and people look at you like you're, you know, some sort of Buddhist monk, but no, I mean, every country, in the world, every country and culture has some tradition of spirituality. And you know what goes along with that tradition? Without exception, I'm talking China, India, uh, Muslim countries, uh, gold. Gold is a critical feature. It's, it, it's a sacred feature. It's, a, it, it's considered, you know, in the Chinese New Year, they have two colors, red and gold. And gold is not worldly. I mean, gold is otherworldly. It's, it, it, it signifies something that's sacred. And, and it's true in every single religion. It's not just something you can, it, it's, yes, it's a store of value. It's the greatest store of value, but that's not an accident. It's something that's totally special about the metal. If you read about the metal, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's not something you could take for granted. It's not, you know, in, in this material world, we believe everything, including us, was created by some sort of cause and effect. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I think that basically a thousand or 500 years from now, they, they'll, they'll look at a, a, B, BC and AD, but they'll also look at BD and AD before Darwin and after Darwin. I mean, when Darwin came along, it was sort of an excuse to turn to materiality that we're just made out of, you know, our consciousness, everything is just material. That's nonsense. I mean, I'm not going to get into all the discussions there because I mean, I think gold is much more interesting to talk about right now. But um, that was a... That, that was a terrible thing for the West. I mean, and there was no reason for it. We have no evidence of Darwin. We have all evidence of the world against it. I'm not going to get into this. I mean, if you want, I hope to finish a book. Okay. I haven't, I can't advertise it because I haven't finished it yet, but it, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. And we lost a lot of our spirituality. You know, the British have a longer culture than the U.S., obviously. And so do all the European nations. And I think ultimately they're going to come out of this much better than we are because of that. I mean, you, you I think Germany has a tremendous amount of gold in reserves. And it's not just one central bank buying gold. It's one central bank not buying gold. And that's the U.S. Every other, I think almost every other central bank is buying gold. It represents about, I may have made a mistake, but I think it's, 
I think we're up to 18% of reserve assets in the world are in gold. And if there's any funny business in those statistics is that I'm only counting, I think, 3,000 tons or 3,200 tons for China. I mean, China has about less than 5% of their reserve assets in gold. No, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, I don't believe that number. So the overall number, given their size, is probably over 20%. The dollar's down to 50. And someone has to... Well, I'm, I'll let you ask if you, you know, I, you want me to keep going or? No, no, Stephen, of, of course, this is fascinating. I think this is where it's leading is, 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 it's, it's um, please, please. The, the, this is a very, very dangerous situation. And this is where instead of criticizing China, which we do, I mean, we lambast science. China. As I said, I want to emphasize again, I am not a Chinophile. I could never be a Chinophile. I don't share their culture. I mean, in, in order to, to live comfortably, you have to share a good culture. And, you know, I don't live comfortably here right now because we don't live in a good culture. We live in total materiality, which is just crazy. And we have no evidence for this materiality. But in China, I, I think they're trying their hardest to get us to cooperate. I mean, Andy, it, it, it's, it, it's beyond ludicrous if you, if you just think about it. I mean, obviously our sanctions, I mean, what do we, I think we sanctioned Russia with 16,000 sanctions. It, it's just extraordinary. And they have demonstrated that there, those sanctions have enabled them to be, I think, the fastest growing large economy in the world. They really don't have an inflation problem. They are outproducing the entire West in terms of uh, military equipment from tanks to ammunition. And they've made, a, a, they've destroyed Ukraine. They're likely to take Kharkiv. I, I don't know how long, but maybe not in the too distant future. And then Odessa, and then it's game over. Then Ukraine is just a landlocked, uh, you know, country. And they don't want the rest. They don't want the West. The A. I mean, how everything that you see here is so ridiculous. I mean, the East and West of Ukraine were never meant to be one country. They're two different cultures entirely. Their languages are different. Ukrainian language is probably a little more similar to Polish than it is to Russian, as an example. Uh, they... You know, this was something that was done by Stalin, you know, sort of on, almost on a whim. I mean, he, he wasn't a great, you know, geopolitical thinker. I mean, he knew he certainly had a role in the Second World War and are, are winning it. I mean, that that's for sure. I mean, which is also crazy about what we're doing. How about that? You know, yes, we helped Russia during the Second World War, 20, but, but we, we gave them money, but they sacrificed 20 million people something like that in Stalingrad and they beat the Germans. I mean, they should get some credit for that and Putin should get a little bit more credit. Again, I couldn't live in Russia, but I could come closer there because I do share a lot of their culture. I mean, I like their music. I mean, you know, Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky, etc. cetera. But um, we, this whole thing is ridiculous, but coming back to China, this is the probably the most ridiculous thing ever. <laughs> Historians are not going to believe this. I mean, I honestly don't think so. The sanctions that we have, okay, with the military sanctions against Russia, the, the economic military sanctions against Russia have obviously totally failed, completely failed. Um, in every which way. It inspired them to really ramp up their military production, everything else. Now they're an incredibly formidable military power. I, I don't think for a minute they plan to attack NATO or any of this other stuff. I mean, if anyone reads Putin's speeches, I, I doubt that anyone that has criticized him has ever, ever read one of his speeches. And I, I never have, but I've read English translations and I have Russian friends that have, you know, told me that these are valid. I mean, he refer refers to Sermon on the Mount. What American politician makes any spiritual references, true spiritual references in, in their speeches? I haven't heard one since Kennedy. Um, 
maybe Reagan occasionally. I don't really remember, but Kennedy was filled with them. I mean, especially when he was visiting Ireland. Kennedy had, he had, Khrushchev was a monster. He was next to Stalin. I mean, he was probably more of a monster than, than Stalin. Stalin had an excuse, at least. He was paranoid, but he was paranoid because everybody hated him. And, you know, he, he came out of a, the, the Bolsheviks, which were basically Jewish, and he wasn't. And he thought everyone was trying to assassinate him. And he may have been right. I'm not justifying anything Stalin did. He was a true monster true, complete monster. Khrushchev was at least as bad. He didn't have the opportunity to show how bad he was because he wasn't fighting a war and he wasn't, you know, just randomly doing things, but he, he was, he was a real deal. He was, he was awful despite that. Kennedy and Khrushchev had a constant dialogue going. And that was one reason we avoided, you know, catastrophe during the Cuban Missile Crisis. They, 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 they have these letters that they have found between Khrushchev and Kennedy. Kennedy wanted, he wanted peace. He wanted, you know, success. I mean, uh, su success in terms of well-being for the population. China is no different. And except China is thinking now worldwide. And coming back to what I think, I'm sorry to get, I get distracted sometimes. I take, I'm, I suffer from ADHD. I can't help it. I confess. But anyway, this is ridiculous. I'm just going to focus on this. Okay. In, in sanctioning people, uh, countries for other than military, uh, we have to, we're sanctioning China's technology. Basically, that's what we're focused on. We don't want them to catch up and they're kind of defying us. Probably. And I say probably because we really don't know whether they've developed this on their own or not. But the key, the focal point of these sanctions is clearly Taiwan Semiconductor, one company. And it is arguably, I, I think clearly, I mean, it's, it's certainly arguably, and I would say clearly the most important certainly technology company in the world. And maybe to the extent you believe technology is, you know, very, very important to our future, which I think most of us can accept, they're the most important country in the world. To give you an example, they produce at least 70% of the, the, the advanced semiconductors that the world uses. The U.S. produces zero. Uh, South Korea probably produces somewhere between 20 and 30, but they're typically behind Taiwan Semiconductor. Now, where is Taiwan Semiconductor? Well, it's across a, a, a little straight from China, from mainland China, and China wants to join uh, uh, um, with Taiwan. And they obviously want to join peacefully. Does it really make sense to blow up a country you want to join with? I think what they're trying to do now, this is what, what I've said so far. Everything is non-speculative. I mean, Russia, Taiwan having 70, maybe 80 percent of market share in terms of worldwide manufacturing of semiconductors. I mean, they're a much more important company, for example, than ASML. Uh, without Taiwan Semiconductor, ASML is just wasted, you know, all this advanced research. I, I mean, and they... they there, there would be, you know, many competitors. Taiwan Semiconductor is a unique company and it's part of, you know, what China considers to be, it's, you know, China. I mean, and they, it is China. All the people there are Chinese. And, you know, another example I have to, you know, deviate just, to, just for a second to say that our technology companies right now, our best, in my opinion, technology companies, NVIDIA, and uh, advanced micro devices are run by two Taiwanese. And in fact, if you look at Microsoft, if you look at Google, you, you don't find Chinese, but you find Asians. I mean, the East have basically with company, I, I consider Microsoft and Google the two primary technology companies in, in this country and Intel is nowhere. And uh, advanced micro devices and um, NVIDIA is probably the two best manufacturing companies. And I didn't make it clear. And Google and Microsoft, the two companies that are non-manufacturing, but their software, et cetera. We're talking on Google right now.
now, for example, uh, and they're run by Indians. And Bill Gates, you know, when he left and his successors were there, Microsoft was just dead in the water, dead in the water for, you know, it wasn't like they were going broke. I mean, they were making money. They weren't growing. But the fellow that took over, educated in India, ha has taken that company to, you know, the ultra heights. And, you know, the, the NVIDIA is questionable. I mean, because they basically, I, I, I think that they're, you know, subject to this one chip, but they, they, they took a certain type of uh, semiconductor chip called, uh, called a GPU. And it's now something that weighs 70 pounds and, you know, basically just consumes too much energy. That's the problem with it. But if you combine, I mean, in the AMD with NVIDIA, you're going to have basically, um, you know, a really effective chip because the person that took over for, this is fascinating. I mean, when she, when this woman took over AMD, they were a rounding error for for in terms of Intel's uh, uh, revenues. Today, they they trump Intel. This is only in the past decade. Intel lost everything when they lost their you know their link to the past. I mean, for a long time, Intel could trace their uh, um, their their like Andy Grove. He, he could be traced back to Shockley, the man that got the Nobel Prize for the, one of the three that got the Nobel Prize for creating the transistor. I mean, Intel had this amazing lineage and it was the greatest company, it, but not, you know, coming back to it, they lost that lineage and they lost their share. I mean, they don't, a, I mean, they used to be what AM, uh, what, what TSM is today, Taiwan Semiconductor. But, but here's the point that I'm making. I think China right now is, is in a position to basically change currencies. You know, I think that I, I don't know if there's a holdup or not, but I think eventually you're, you're going to get to. I mean, there's absolutely nothing that I can see that can stop them. We, we've told the West very clearly that the weaponry that comes out of China, even though China doesn't use it, they're not a war like, when's the last war China's been in? I mean, what year has China fought a war in this century? None. What year has the United States not been in a war this century? Yeah. None. Yeah. Now, I mean, you know, really, it, it, it's, it's like that. And I think China is, is desperate. Not so much. I, I think they, they feel very assured that they can dominate the situation. That, that, that's my take. It was my take really confirmed by that recent visit to Blinken, uh, Blinken to China. When she, I mean, when they broadcast something that she says on the media, it's not an ac accident. It's that like someone overheard him and said, hey, let's let everybody know about that. That's not how things work in China. It's one thing, one reason I wouldn't want to be there. I mean, if you did that, you would. I don't know what would happen to you if, if they were saying what she said, uh, especially if it was controversial, wouldn't be <laughs> would, if that person wouldn't be around much longer or he certainly wouldn't be a public figure anymore. Uh, he wouldn't be in journalism. Uh, but what she said when Blinken was coming to visit him on his way out, you know, last visit, I mean, he didn't spend much time with she at all on his last visit. Uh, he was said to have said that, where is he? And uh, how long is he going to stay? That's what he's saying about this. You know, when I'm out of here. I mean, that's basically interpretation. That's how he's talking about the Secretary of State of the United States. I mean, he wanted to, I think, let people know that, yes, he's in control of things and he's not at all scared of America at this point. And I think that that's the case. And he feels he does have control of this situation. I mean, we demonstrated, or not we, they demonstrated, I mean, through Iran. I mean, the technology China has is probably superior to Russia. In fact, I'm sure it is. I'm nearly sure. I mean, when I say I'm sure, I'm not sure. But I, I mean, it's a pretty safe bet. Mm. I mean, they just have too many people. Russia can't compete. And their weaponry is superior. Russia's weaponry, as we've seen in Ukraine, these hypersonic missiles, they have no answer to them. Iran, 
when they decided to, I mean, this is also very interesting, when they decided to, to, to attack Israel uh, in response to the fact that Israel killed 20 of their, you know, 10 of their generals or something in an attack on Syria, what they did is they told everybody they were going to attack Israel. They attacked Israel and uh, gave them five hours notice, sent a whole bunch of drones over there. I mean, that were shot down. And I'm sure that was part of the plan, but then sent anywhere from five to 12 hypersonic missiles or missiles. I'm not sure all of them were hypersonic. They penetrated what is considered to be the most impenetrable piece of land on this planet, namely the Air Force base uh, that houses Air Force One of Israel, Israel's most important. It, it went through it like, like, like a bullet going through silk. And they landed, you know, five to 12 missiles here. No one was killed. But it was basically just a strong message. Look, we're a brand. And, you know, in terms of technology, we're not going to have as good a technology as Russia. And Russia doesn't have as good as China. So if you really want America to, you know, come on, America, do you really want to fight a war with us? We don't want to fight a war with you. But, you know, we're just letting you know we have a lot of weapons. And I think that that was a very, very clear message. I, I hope I'm not coming off as anti-American. Again, I want to emphasize, I grew up saying prayers at night. And, you know, I have a Jewish and, and Catholic background, and it was non-sectarian prayers. I mean, I, it, that was what the 50s and, you know, were like. I'm that, you know, I'm old enough to remember the 50s. And they were like that. And the 60s, in their own way, were very much like that. We had a spirituality in this country, and it manifested itself in many ways. And hopefully the kids today are taking up that, you know, that, that battle. But that's going to be a long time happening. But anyway, China right now is in a position, I believe. They have carrots and sticks to, to bring Taiwan over in a peaceful way. The sticks are obvious. The U.S. cannot defend Taiwan at this point. They have China has these hypersonic missiles. Their navy is is formidable, and their air force is incredibly formidable. Plus, they have a three, I think, a two million man standing army. We we have one million people in our army. Sure. That they're, I mean, it becomes sort of ridiculous, but. Talking to Taiwan, then I'll finish, is they can present many, many potential sticks. America's not going to protect you, which is true with Saudi Arabia. There's not a, you know, Saudi Arabia is not a stupid country. They join BRICS because now they can rely on Iran instead of as an enemy. Instead of an enemy, they can rely on them as kind of a friend. I mean, they, they have a, they're surrounded by people that can protect them and no one that can really threaten them, namely Israel. They can't threaten Saudi Arabia now. I mean, Iran demonstrated that, never mind Russia and, and what China could do. Okay, so that's our, those, are, those are the sticks against Taiwan. But what's very interesting, Andy, and I was stunned by this. I will be very honest. I mean, I, I'm prepared for a lot of things, but I was looking at Hong Kong which is sort of what Taiwan would become, sort of a separate administrative district for China. And I was looking at Hong Kong in terms of what they call a human development index. I believe that's what it is. It measures uh, life expectancy. It measures health, education, uh, income. And yeah, I think those are the three parts. And the, the world's major countries are rated in terms of this index. Hong Kong, after the riots, everything else that happened in Hong Kong, and there's a lot of craziness that goes on with a lot of speculation that goes on with those riots and who was behind it. But this is pretty well known. Uh, the, the, the Chinese army made a couple of appearances in Hong Kong and they weren't carrying guns. They were carrying brooms. They cleaned up the place. And if you look at the length of the uh, of the riots that went on in Hong Kong, how many people were killed? Well, one. And that wasn't even clearly because of a riot. It was because it may have been, it may have been related to the riot, but he fell in a stadium and unfortunately lost his life. But that's one person. 
typical riot in this country. I mean, on a typical weekend, I mean, you might find more than one person or I don't know how many people are killed. But um, they really did not interfere that much. At the end, they passed some new laws, et cetera. I don't like that. But if you look at the net result, Hong Kong now, in terms of this human development index, stands number four in the world behind Switzerland, I, I believe Denmark, Norway, and Hong Kong. Now, it's even more than that. Their growth, their, how fast that HDI is grow, gaining in Hong Kong, this is in the aftermath of those riots, is faster than any of the top three. So it's not unimaginable that they would end up number one. And now the other administrative district is, is equally fascinating. It's, it's Macau, where all the gambling takes place. They're not as strong as in education. But in terms of, of, of uh, life expectancy and income, they're probably the highest in the world. So these are carrots. Are you really scared? I mean, who are you more scared of? The, the United States? Look what they've done to their outlook. Look, look, look what happened to Germany. Suddenly they don't have the North Stream. Suddenly they don't have access to cheap gas. I mean, you want the United States as your ally? Or would you rather have us when you can look at what, how Hong Kongers are living now better in terms of these human characteristics than anyone else? And part and parcel of China, uh, again, is their spirituality. And, and, and you know, you could find, not quoted in English, but, you know, Chinese, I mean, I read this about 10 years ago. All you have to do is is read what basically China had written uh, after the uh, 2008-9, um, you know, crash. They wrote, uh, there was one thing that, well, I remember one phrase. I don't remember the whole thing. It was translated for me. I mean, and I think it was translated on one or two other websites. But one of the phrases is, Gold is part of the Chinese dream. It's going to back our currency. I mean, it's going to back. That's what it's designed for. It's a spirit. Like I started out by saying, New Year's, just look at the, the costumes the Chinese wear. Gold is there because it's sacred. It's part, It's spiritual to them. And, and if you read what the, um, that, that was the, uh, that, that was written by the, um, the person in charge of gold for that reports the Politburo. So it was, you know, the highest gold person, related person in China. And the, at the same time, the central bank of China, I mean, I wrote about this four years ago. I mean, in, in my last book, it, it said that we want a system, ideally, that would have something like the SDRs backed by another commodity. And he, he never mentioned gold. I mean, it's very, the only time you've ever heard gold mentioned in a monetary way in China was in Chinese. In this, as far as I can tell, and this one thing that was, you know, you could translate. I mean, they, you know, they hold things close together, but you don't have to be uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes to realize China's accumulated, you know, what some, some, I think you, you, you quoted somebody as saying 30 or 40,000 tons. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. It, it's huge. Sure monstrous amounts. Uh, and they can use that if they want to back up currencies. And so they have, they have everything they need. But what I believe is instead of using, instead of introducing a new currency and having Saudi Arabia, I mean, I, I look, I have to confess this, I don't understand as well as I should. But I would think that ideally what they would like to see is um, commodities like oil priced in terms of this new currency. In other words, today, when you ask anywhere in the world, what's the price of oil? They'll say about 88, I don't know, whatever it is, 88, 89 dollars, no matter where, be dollars. They would like that to be the case that once they introduce this new currency, you ask anybody in the world what the price of oil, well, maybe half, maybe a third or some fraction of the world will still say dollars. But a very large portion of the year, world will say, let's say, 50 units. However, this this new currency is uh, demonetized in, and it would be units of something or other, but it would be units of a basket, and uh, that basket would be backed by gold. And it is it is all about oil. 
You're, you're right. Stephen, it's all about oil. Uh, everyone who's ever tried to price oil other than in dollars has been either eradicated um, um, or, or the country's been invaded. And, and I think um, this is what this is partly what I think it, it, it's about. It's the Davos crowd. Um, the reason, you know, whenever I hear a single narrative anywhere, and and I, as you do, you question a single narrative. When every single mainstream media questions a single narrative, and it can be anything, but in this case, it is Russia, uh, evil Russia, um, who basically, um, really, if you think about it, um, was selling. Um, was pricing oil in gold, in terms of gold. Now, right. obviously, that has hit a sore point because if you take, um, if, if there's one way of de of um, of really debasing the dollar in a more rapid de-dollarization process, is to when you have when you have basically the global South and the BRICS members and all the oncoming members control really either produce or consume 85% of all the energy complexes. Uh, and why are they going to price that in dollars when they can price it in this uh, a currency gold. which is backed <laughs> by gold? And that's exactly what's happening. And I think the, the interesting part, you've talked about a lot about China, and we get a lot of questions about this, uh, Stephen, is quite clearly China has now been capitalizing. Finally, it's come to a point where we've known for years that Russia and China have been buying gold and removing it from the West, alchemizing basically paper gold. And it's reached an inflection point, uh, and I believe it happened on the 13th of uh, February of this year, it reached an inflection point where suddenly it shifted from the, the liquidity shifted from the uh, from from China being a price taker to China being a price maker. Wow, that's interesting. And suddenly, we in the West have become the price taker, and suddenly you see gold rise four hundred bucks from that inflection point where the Fed sleepwalked themselves, sleepwalked themselves into daring to to actually tackle central bank bids. That were at twenty three hundred bucks. Uh, sorry, at two thousand bucks. They dared to do that on the uh, uh, and again because they've sort of coddled themselves in this view that seventy five percent of all the CTAs, the hot money, is a momentum chasers and what they rely on to um, to actually uh, move the price of gold because you can what any you can lay stuff off in the COMEX silo. And it, and it never has to be settled anywhere else. But all of a sudden, the lines flipped. And these momentum traders overran those central bank bids. Now, bearing in mind that gold is 96% leveraged, and you suddenly got massive 900 tons uh, of physical orders at 96% having to be literally fully funded Landing in a, the deliverable FX markets, which are Basel III compliant and heading into that was the inflection point. And people ask me, yes, but is this going to reverse? No, it won't, because China has made commitments in 2010 and also again last May, a year ago, to incentivize citizens to buy gold, opening up bank accounts to include now the smaller, the smaller citizens, the smaller investors. And of course, what does that mean? It means that, and they've said, we will, you will, uh, you will, appre you, your gold will appreciate. We are telling you to buy this gold because it will appreciate in value. Well, they're in and they're forcing that price to, in yuan terms, to be made sure that all these new investors that have come in to, 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 to gold in yuan terms, are seeing a higher yuan price. And even if the West decides to smack the price of bullion down in dollar terms, then they just expand the premium to 150 bucks 
over the US price. <laughs> and suddenly the arbitrages come in and say, hey, I can I can get 150 bucks more in Shanghai. And and of course, we all know that um that that China also has over three trillion in shadow banking reserves on top of their three an additional three trillion. And in addition to the so you've nailed you've nailed this China. You're so right in bringing China up because it's the pivotal, the pivotal um, effect of driving a goal, the gold price higher and higher and higher. And most people say three thousand dollar gold is just cheap, cheap. At this price. Right. It's, it's, it's not even a first stop, I don't think. But I mean, it, it, it's what, what what I think China feels so sure of themselves at this point. And, and, and Andy, I, you know, that's one thing I wish, incidentally, I just want to stop. And as a sidebar, I wish I didn't know that. I mean, you, you, you told me that. I mean, in one of your videos, because now what I have to worry about, in addition to everything else, and this does give me kind of nightmares. I'm not joking about it. How short might JP Morgan be? Is there any way of knowing? I'm looking at gold right now up about $25 and volume, almost 200,000 contracts are traded. How many of those are naked shorts that are being rolled over that belong to JP Morgan that might I mean these are I don't think the CTAs are capable of of, of shorting a, to this extent. I mean maybe they are. I have no idea. I mean I don't know that much about you know much more much much more more than I do about this. But I know enough to realize that you know gold is measured in the trillions. Uh, uh, <laughs> J P Morgan's assets are not measured in the trillions and. That's the biggest bank. Everybody talks about, well, the real estate exposure. Well, that's regional banks. We can handle uh, a regional bank going. Uh, we can handle 10 or 20 regional banks going under, but we can't handle one major bank running into trouble. And uh, I, I, we have some money at JP Morgan right now. I think I'm taking it out. I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to end up with Kinesis. I, I think it's it's marvelous that you're offering this. I think it's a service to the world. And I am not being paid for this. And if any, if I put people in Kinesis, I, I won't even accept, uh, you know, any uh, whatever, you know, payment. I, I don't want, I mean, I think I just want to do good. The, the evolution of money. Right. It's the, evo this is because it's gold backed and it, it's a, it's a, it's basically what the currency is, the, the new currency will look like. I mean, you know, it, it, it's 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 a wonderful, you know, interim tool. And it may, you know, may last. There may be reasons for using Kinesis rather than the new. I don't know if the new, new currency actually will be available in separate countries. Separate countries may have their own currencies, but they may be backed by gold, too. I'm that, that that's still an open issue for me. I'm not sure. And, you know, I was always writing about this. The one thing I could not get past, I got up to, you know, the basket and I got up to back by gold and, you know, more or less, I, I think that that's sort of where we're still headed. I mean, you know, the details, um, I, I just don't know enough to, to specify them, but I never was able to get what the U.S. is going to do. Are they going to be willing to cooperate? How crazy can they be? They're still in a position, in my opinion. And this is my opinion, and I hope I'm right, that if we cooperate, decide to cooperate, decide to join forces, and I think China desperately, not desperately, but they really, truly want that. They don't want to destroy the United States. They don't. It would not do them any good. They, 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 they basically, part of their culture is they are only interested, they, their major interest is the well-being of Chinese but it happens that the well-being of Chinese involves the well-being of everyone else in the world. Yes, Stephen, that's it. You've nailed it. It is correct. It, it is, they are a multipolar solution. They don't want to, they don't want to invade anyone. They simply want to be a component of a, of a multipolar um, a, a system of a, 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 an aggregation of countries that have taken down their fences and have actually worked together for mutual benefit of each other. I mean, without giving up their sovereignty. Who's against this? There's only one power that's against this, the unipolar, really, dollar.
dollar-based system. U.S., United States. So, and in, in, in coming back to, to, to Taiwan Semiconductor, I think China's aim right now may be to give the United States one last chance because if they're able to unite with Taiwan, and this is very speculative on my part, though I'm going to argue that it's it's certainly what they may be up to. This fellow Ma, who used to be uh, a president of Taiwan, has already seen mm. Xi. I think that the new president will be uh, inaugurated this weekend. The legislature is not against, they're, they're sort of pro-mainland. I mean, there's pro-mainland and there's, call it what it is, there's pro-US. There's pro-mainland China, there's pro-US, which is sort of weird if you think about it because there's a lot of intermarriage between Taiwanese and China. I mean, if you're willing to wait a hundred years, there won't be any differences in the states. Intermarriage would take over, but you, we can't wait a hundred years. We wouldn't have a world. I mean, you know, it, it, the way we're going uh, with the US, et cetera. But, um, what they want to do, I think, again, speculative, is take control of the mainland peacefully. Let them join as Hong Kong has joined. Let them be part of it. Then all of a sudden, Taiwan Semiconductor is no longer, and I, again, I can't emphasize how important this country, this company, this one company developed by Chinese, Taiwanese, but Chinese, they're all, the same. they're all Chinese. That's basically what they are. Uh, I have neighbors next door. One is Taiwanese, one's mainland China. I mean, you know, there's basically, they're, they're the same ethnicities. Uh, so there's every reason to suspect that if she presents this, and not every reason, there are a lot of reasons to suspect that Taiwan may go along. If they realize they may end up getting stuck because China is making a lot of progress. They're making progress in, in developing the next generation, major generation of uh, semiconductors, which will probably be photonics. And if you go to Google Scholar, look up the, the, the authors of all the stuff on photonics, the stuff that's actually published in Western journals like, like Your Nature, which I think is probably the best, is that they've become not, not as bad as science, which is our journal, but, you know, they're, sometimes they print stuff that they should not print, in my opinion. But they, they, to their credit, they do print a lot of stuff that does admit to West weakness. They still are very, they're, they're an extremely fine scientific journal, in my opinion. But, but, you know, the point is, is that if Taiwan Semiconductor, you know, doesn't come along, they may get beaten anyway with, you know, a new type of semiconductor that runs on photonics. But that probably won't happen for at least a decade. I don't know. But China sometimes surprises you. They came out with a competitor to the Apple phone in, what, two years? Huawei produced that? That was amazing. Everybody thought it would take a decade for them to catch up, to produce a five nanometer chip that basically, you, no, no one can really tell the difference between five and three nanometers and operating an iPhone. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's, they're the same. I mean, as far as that goes. but. For the U.S. to lose control of Taiwan semiconductors, they lose control of their ability to sanction technology, not just in China, but everywhere. And that, that, could, that condemns them to basically second or third or fourth place. They don't make any semiconductors in the U.S. They used to be number one by virtue of Intel. Intel doesn't make semiconductors. They design them today. Now, Taiwan Semiconductor is building supposedly two factories. And this is, I mean, this is so sad. I mean, there's no other word for it. They're keep extending the date lines on these factories. The first one will not be the latest in technology. It'll produce, you know, chips that are good, but not 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 the, the latest. They cannot find workers that meet their specifications because our education, which used to be the best in the world, has so badly slipped. Mm. They're having a devil of a time. And the cost structure is is you know crazy over here compared to there uh, it, it compared to uh you know Taiwan and 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 China that they 
I don't think they'll ever get these factories finished. And if they do, it'll be in five or six years. So, I mean, basically the world is stuck with, well, maybe they'll build something in Japan. Japan is a little bit different, but if we, if they, if we lose, the United States loses control of Taiwan Semiconductor, that I'm praying, and I, I mean that literally, I'm praying that'll be enough of a cudgel, is that the word, to hold against the U.S. to say, we want you to cooperate. Now you have no more ability. You can no longer sanction anybody militarily. You proved that in the war. And now we've taken away your ability to sanction technologically, but you still have wonderful technology there. We have wonderful people. As I mentioned before, I mean, you, you see elements of the spirituality in, in, in some of our modern music. It's, it is very, you know, there is a path back for us. It's not going to be painless. We're not going to be the number one country in the world, but we could still be number one are close to number one, maybe number one in the West, possibly. We're not going to face the way we're going now. It's going to be right now about 50% of the world's reserves are held in dollars. Let's say that percentage is obviously going to move down. It may not move to zero right away, but if it moves to 25%, that's hyperinflation. That's Everybody's going to be sending their dollars back. They're going to be selling all the dollars, you know, which are held, I guess, in T-bills and whatever they're held in. That's going to be massive number of dollars chasing what we can't produce an EV. And yet we're putting, we, look, I, 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 I'm lost for words when I think of these tariffs. What, what, what good does it do to pay, to put it, it, a, an economy that has basically been wedded to this green initiative? I have no idea. And I don't think anyone has any idea. No one can model the climate 50 years in the future. It's, it's insanity to think we can. But And there's other better ways of dealing with it. You can use bamboo to, to absorb all the CO2, but what, whatever. Green is, is very good in, in a certain sense. Resources are not going to last forever. And I think this is basically what motivating China as much as anything else you're going to need a substitute for oil one day. Maybe not now, but in 20 years or, you know, it's not a, it's not an infinite resource. You're going to need fusion probably. And you, you're not going to get to fusion unless you're going to have a base on the moon to get helium three and China's, you know, position. They're landing these rockets on the far side of the moon. No one could see what they're doing there. I mean, they're probably br bringing back helium three. I mean, you know, one thing that is, but, but the, I don't, I don't want to lose. My, my, my trend of thought, we're, we're, we're slapping 100% tariffs on EVs. Now, how much sense does this make if you're really after a green economy? Well, first of all, we don't have a grid in this country that will accommodate the solar and the wind that we've already built. I mean, we have to build out a, a, a grid and we need a lot of motivation to do that. We don't have Ford loses $100,000 on an EV that it makes. Does that sound like we're going to be uh, producing mass producing EVs anytime soon? No, it, it, it's it's ridiculous. Uh, General Motors has done a little better, but still the cheapest EV in this country, even with a 100 percent tariff on the Chinese EVs, is uh is still going to be more than competitive. It'll be priced at twenty two thousand versus twenty five thousand for Ford. But why do we want to put these tariffs on EVs when we can't make them ourselves? Because China has over what what does it mean to have overcapacity? Overcapacity of a vital material, a vital item for the green uh, uh, agenda. I mean, we should be welcoming them. We should encourage everybody to buy EVs from China in this country. It's not going to threaten anybody. It's not going to, you know, it's not like every EV is going to be wired with a spy machine. I mean, it, it's, it's just insanity. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, it's a case of follow the money yet again. In every it's instance, totally it's Andy. a case of follow the money. And this, I mean, for example, uh, yes, the temperatures, when you look at climate change, yes, the temperatures have risen. But in his, historically, all the measure uh, measurements for temperature were in the countryside. All of a sudden, all these measurements are in cities and in parking lots. 
and no adjustment has been made. And when you have a critical difference like that, that is unadjusted, you can spin the numbers. Oh, how terrible. Everything is now much hotter than it ever was. It's not true. And, and, and this is what I mean. So then you've got this, this whole electric thing going on. Well, hang on. I mean, there are some, some brilliant people out there who have come up with, well, hold on a minute. We could have just created a different fuel for our existing cars. That's and true, too. Course, it would probably be hydrogen-based, et cetera, et cetera. It could have been done, but follow the money. And all of this is yet again, a, a, it's also part of the WEF uh, program to ensure that we follow the, the, the narrative, follow the narrative, do as you're told, don't think. And any time you come up with uh, a different idea, you're slanted. And, and um, you know, there, there's been some very, very smart people who've come out, who t technology people who have said, but of course it would have been easy to c come up with a better fuel. You even mentioned it earlier, uh, Stephen. Of course you can come up with a more, uh, a better fuel for existing cars. Um, so this whole thing, but I was going to ask you one thing because you, you kind of went over to the US and, and on your side of the pond, I just like to, because, um, uh, you know, we, we're seeing something pretty spectacular, which I, I am amazed at. Now, Kinesis is a massive supporter of the sound money movement. And uh, we've got a close relationship with them. And, and, and we, I just, noted that Nebraska, I think, was the 12th state to end income taxes on gold and silver. And importantly, and this is importantly, all of these sound money um, adopters declare that CBD, central bank digital currencies, are not lawful money. Can I, can you just give me your thoughts on that? Steve? It's, 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 it's a suicide to, to, you know, to not have uh, something like kinesis. I mean, Andy, I, I I really am, you know, because I manage money. This is how, incidentally, I, I I learned a lot because people that manage money, they, they don't have to take a Hippocratic oath like doctors do. The, the doctors ignore it too, but uh, that's another story. I mean, that would take us too far away, but I, I do. I mean, I care about my, my, my clients. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want my last memory on this earth to be, oh man, I wish I... Had had really told these people about something like kinesis and 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 not watch them get the, all their money confiscated because that's a real possibility. I mean, I'm scared. I'm scared of that. Now I'm scared of Canada too. I mean, I have gold and silver in in uh, Sprott, which I think is I think it's okay, but it's it, it, it's better than the U.S. But I think kinesis. I mean, Europe. Yes, I think Europe will will be there. And I think Kinesis is, is, is a wonderful gift to the world. And I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you. I, I, in fact, I will probably lose money if, if, if I start telling my uh, clients to put your money in Kinesis, even the money that we're holding for you, hold it in Kinesis. And then if you, you know, want to pay us, I mean, I, I would take money paid in Kinesis. I, I, actually, I mean, I can't charge them on that money because that would run afoul of the law. I mean, I can charge them on the cash we're holding for them, but I would much rather have, if any of my clients are listening, have your money in Kinesis. I mean, that makes a lot more sense. You'll be better protected. Now we'll lose money because, you know, so you know that I'm not doing this in, as, as self-interest. I'm doing it in your interest because I don't want to see people get their money confiscated. This is an ugly kind of situation we may end up in. We, like you said, follow the money. Yeah. And it's absolutely true. We're a totally material society now. But globally, globally, while everyone tries to or says, and everyone says it, we aim to build back better. Well, it means you have to break something to build something better. So I guess really the bottom, bottom line is when we talk to each other, but yes, but what do we do about it? What we do about it is what you said is we make sure that we are protect ourselves. We get out of these debasing fiat currencies Exactly. Continuously being printed and are going to zero. And what we do is we exchange those for physical gold. And I think this is where, so this is why I'm so passionate about Kinesis because, but 
you can't walk around with a coin and pay for a Starbucks. You can't walk around with a bar uh, and, and, <laughs> no, and pay I know. for um, a, a, a suit. You know, so so what we do is literally facilitate that so that that same bar that you own that you can take delivery of any time you want, you can now use Ikthus. Take my, I pay for everything on my phone. I just literally pay for everything on my phone. I put all my money into all my fiat into into physical gold and silver, and then I go to the supermarket and say, I just paid in gold, and they go, what? And how? And I said, well, <laughs> it's simple. It's simple. So you know, there are solutions. And so I think what we're saying is there are solutions. And, and I, I know that you, I, I know that you are a supporter of us. And that's why I'm, I bring it up. And the thing is, is that everyone that you bring in will also be rewarded by bringing other people in because all we do is share and you will too. All we do is all share in a visible pool. Uh, where it powers the system, it provides liquidity to the system, and and it provides this pool, this pool of liquidity. Let me just walk you through. I mean, I just thought of this because you know, I, just a second as you mentioned that in the supermarket, it's very very. I mean, that, that that's a very wonderful illustration because anything that you buy with dollars, let's face it, you look at a dollar. What the hell is this? It's not backed by anything. It's just a piece of paper. Gold will never be a piece of paper. And for that reason, you're going to think twice before parting with any of this gold. When you spend your kinesis, you're parting with gold. And that's a much more difficult decision to make than parting with dollars. Who cares? I mean, it, I'm not saying it's exactly like that, but that's what materiality is all about. This money is used to control people. And because Bill Gates basically reviews, views everyone. I don't know where this guy is going. Does he think he's going to live forever? I mean, he's, it's delusional. It's totally delusional to think that monetary, a pure monetary world, absent gold, is going to make any sense. It's got to self-destruct in the end because there's, there's no there there. There has to be a spirituality. Yeah. That that permeates your life, it, 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 and if you're going into the supermarket, just a simple thing like that. I mean, how much simpler can it be than just going into a supermarket and buying something, which everyone does? If you know that you're parting with something that's spiritual, that that it means something to you. You're exchanging it for something that's not a piece of paper. You're buying food with something that's really worth something. Yeah, and and the good thing is, Stephen, is that as soon as I get a deposit fiat deposit, I get rid of that fiat deposit straight into, into gold. And then I'm then protected from the, the next debasement of, of that damn currency. And yes, I'll keep a lot of it uh, unspent. And, and if, I'm, if I'm fortunate enough not to have to spend it, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we all have to spend money uh, on utility bills and one thing or another. So as soon as I put everything, all my fiat into gold, then all I do is simply use that to pay for goods. To go into the supermarket, just like you said, with your kinesis, it, it, it's you're taking spirituality with you. It's in your pocket or in your wallet or uh, how it's related to something that you have to think about. And Simone Weil, she you know, died at 32, supporting, uh, uh, um, you know, the anti-Franco movement in Spain. And the reason she died is she refused. I mean, she was a sickly woman, young woman, only 32, as I said. And she refused to take uh, rations or food that was any more than the rations that were given to the people that were fighting in the war. Well, she died <laughs> from tuberculosis. But anyway, she made this comment and it stuck with me. She's talking about beauty and you can't define beauty. You know, gold is beautiful. Everybody has accepted that gold is beautiful. I mean, it, it's, it's, it has a natural luster that you can't explain. And you're never going to be able to explain beauty and things like that. I mean, uh, truth is beauty. Beauty is truth. I mean, Keith said that. What does it mean? Well, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it still resonates with everybody. But so she's talking about beauty and she said, you can't deny that gold is beautiful. And she said, you know, it's curious that uh, when gold was part of our monetary system, people, yes, would accumulate gold. 
but uh, they they would you know yeah she, they would accumulate it's it's a it's a store of value. But when we took out gold from our monetary system, people then started accumulating dollars in order to get power. And they were willing to use dollars to get power. When gold is at the source of your monetary system, you don't want it. You're not going to accumulate it to get power because you don't want to, you don't want to spend it. It's not, it's not for that reason. It, it, it's, it really, it, it says a lot in, in just an offhand comment, like your supermarket comment is, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, it's, it, we, we, we just have to, Get back what we lost. As I said, when I, I it, when I was a little boy, I, every night I said a non-sectarian prayer, a little rhyme. I'm not, not going to go through it, but I mean, it was a little rhyme, but it referred to God. And I, I think maybe to the extent that I've gotten through this and to the extent that I was willing, look, I, it, it, this is, you wouldn't recognize me today from what I was like seven or eight years ago. When I saw this stuff coming down, I mean, I'm totally different, but I mean, that spirituality was always part of me. I mean, it was ingrained in me. And that's why I think you see some of it still lasting because of the parents of some of these people that, you know, are in the song business, what, 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 whatever. I mean, I was very lucky that I hung on to it or else I, I know I'd be a shadow of myself. I, I don't, I, I, whatever. I just would not be here. But, you know, the, the Brits, I think, have, have they do hold on to it. I mean, you're still an Anglican country, right? I, mean, I don't think we're, we're anything. We're, we're a monetary country. That's all we are. And if you're not rich, you're a cog. That's it. That's how Bill Gates regards everybody as cogs. They're not people. They're, they don't have any spirituality. And if, if you're just material, what are you? Let me ask you a question. If everybody is just built of these material blocks, is there any meaning? Is there any difference between you and this table? Well, you're a little bit more complex, a lot more complicated, but you're still just a material object. You can't have that. You have to have things that are non-material or else everything falls apart. China realizes that. Russia realizes that. I think Britain realizes that still. Most of Europe probably realizes that still. We don't. We got totally away. And like you said, we chased the money. Green was all about chasing money and creating more money opportunities and making all these crazy green ventures. And, and the, it's to, to me, Stephen, it's, it's, I think what, one of the over, you're talking about the, the spiritual side and or the social side of this. Because this is one of the reasons that I wanted to be involved uh, all those years ago, is that ultimately what is happening here is we're providing the, the power for somebody to come out of the bush who's been scraping his gold uh, out, of the, uh, out, of, out of the ground. And instead of being robbed by a broker for a fraction of its value, he now says, here's the spot price. Oh, Kinesis will allow me to facilitate that through the refinery system, through their vaults, and, and then it'll end up in a, in a gold coin or a bar or in my wallet at a fair price to him. And he's no longer being starved of drugs, of, uh, of water, and of a, a fair lifestyle. We've disimmediated that system. We have created right from source all the way to the end user a fair system. And there's that is a social side to it. There is a spiritual side to that. No, it's totally spiritual. It, there is a spiritual side. It, it, is. it combines we combine it's right there. That that little I wish mine had that little button on it. It's it will soon. But I, what you have in your hand is is somewhat spiritual. It really is. I'm, I'm, I, I can't make that point strong enough. Gold has a spiritual aspect. Yeah. How yeah. did it happen? Let me just ask you, just common sense wise, how does it happen that from China to 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 uh, uh, um, Saudi Arabia to any Christian country, gold is sacred? 
how does that happen? That everybody in every country is born with a tendency to believe in a religion, but to believe in something sacred. They've, they've established that. They don't know why. I mean, you know, they're not going to explain it, but it's, it's true. And you can't get away from that. I mean, these people like Gates, et cetera. I keep coming back to him because I just recently heard this speech. I, I, I was horrified. I was totally horrified when he said we, we want the, the poor to catch up with the rich in development. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a non a non monetary tip. If be, before I mean, I, I was on my way to two hip transplants. I mean, you know, where they, you know, therapy, you know, getting these iron things put in your hips. And I said, I'll give a Chinese herbs a try and acupuncture a try. Guess what? No hip transplants. I, I, I jog uh, two miles every day and I couldn't jog uh, uh, two steps before I started taking these herbs. I mean, there, there's something to Western medicine. You can't trust it anymore. You really can't. When I have a dentist that tells me I have a cavity and I have to come back, how do I know I have a cavity? I mean, <laughs> how do I know he just wants to drill a hole in my mouth, fill it up and charge me, you know, a thousand dollars or something like that? I mean, how do I, I mean, I, it's, it's gotten that bad. And I was never, ever like that. Seven years ago, if you told me I'd be saying things like this today, I would have said, you're crazy. You're nuts. I mean, no, I love my dentist. And I do. I think he's a very good man. And I do trust him. I don't want to say anything. Scott, if you're listening, I, I think you're a great guy. But anyway, I, it, but, but it's, it's somewhat true. I'm very, very suspicious of these doctors. They, they don't know any better. I mean, you try and get an article published in a major magazine. I don't want to get into this because I don't want you to get in any trouble. If you want to talk off camera, talk, off, you know, I, I, I can tell you about it. I'm, I'm just not going to mention anything. I, I don't want to. I, I mean, But try Chinese herbs before you try an operation. <laughs> That's the only thing that I'm, especially if it's hips. I'll just cite that one thing. But uh and it's you lose everything when you lose your spirituality. If you can carry it around in your pocket and know that what you're you're trading something spiritual for something that's material, it's going to mean a lot more. It's mm -hmm. going to force you to save, and if you, it's going to force you to accumulate a savings for your heirs, etc. Yeah, I think you should. I mean, have you talked to the Chinese? And how can you combine with what what they want to do with what? You guys are doing. I mean, I think it's I think it's marvelous what you're doing. And I'm not just again. Stephen, it's the inverse of why I, I would want when I get uh, fiat, when I get uh, dollars, pounds, euros, um, I'm incentivized to sell, to spend those as quickly as possible bef before that table that you just touched, before that uh, before that, that that carrot or that vegetables or whatever it is that that will cost more. There'll be more. I'll need more of those next time. Yes, so yes, they yes, get rid yes. of them. So but that's the inverse of, of gold, because obviously, and people call it Gresham's Law, of course. But, but on the other hand, it is just, as you say, there's a spiritual side to this. So I'm considering, considering what I'm doing here, I don't want to spend a, a single gram more than I have to. Um, and so I'll retain that wealth protection as much as I can. Totally, but I'm yes. I'm protected from the price of those things going up and up and up and up. Or no, they're not going up. It's just costing more dollars uh, to buy them. So this is, I think, why it's so important that people have to step out of this win-lose um, uh, monetary system uh, and, and, and migrate to a solution where whether you just simply buy the coins and, and put them in, 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 in your, in your garden or, or in your, in your drawer. But, but this is just a way of doing it on, on an everyday basis, which is logical, pragmatic. If I want my bullion, I'll just click a button and I'll get it delivered to me. So, you know, and why would I do that? Because it's going to cost me, you know, it, it risks me having, having it robbed. So what you know, I mean, where, where are you going to put it? I mean, no, this but is Stephen. When when you write this, when you publish this book, if if I publish it, if I make it, what 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 is the what is? Do you have a do you have a title title for it? My title is basically um, 
you 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 cannot live in a material world. You have to live mm-hmm. in a world where there's a, a a non-material and a material aspect. If you're going to live in that kind of world, you basically have to have a, a, a system uh, of transaction uh, of trading goods that that that's going to involve gold. Basically, it's 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 an extraordinarily special metal. Now, I may have made it, so far, I've been right to, to really emphasize gold in my own portfolio, but I'm beginning to think silver uh, just for the reason that they'll confiscate gold. Silver, they won't because they need it. Gold has, I mean, the remarkable thing is gold has all these extraordinary, not, not the remarkable, one, another remarkable thing is that gold has all these extraordinary properties. It can be stretched to the, uh, uh, to the, the width of a white light wave, li- li- literally. And, and you can't destroy it. Did you know that that, that in 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 uh, France during uh, n- the Nazi invasion, they had these gold medals, Olympic gold medals, solid gold, twenty four karat, I think. They dissolved them in acid, and they let them there for about two years, three years, whatever. And at the end of that period, they recovered all the gold from the acid. <laughs> And they recreated the metal exactly as it was. Yeah. I mean, it's it, try and destroy gold. I mean, you cannot destroy it. A- and it's beauty. They have no idea where it came from. They know where it didn't come from. As, as I've mentioned before on your show, it, it certainly did come from this solar system. They don't have any good theory as to how gold formed. Mm. On an argument for a higher power, I mean, that's a weak argument. I mean, it's weak compared to others that you can make, but it's still, you know, it's consistent. We, we have no idea how to have these all these uh, sightless particles that they're circulating around the universe. Do we really think they somehow coalesced and made planets and made gold? I mean, how did that come about? We have no idea, no idea where to begin. And any idea that we might have contradicts the science, totally contradicts the science that we have today. I mean, it's just insanity what we're doing. And I, I see these people standing up at the WEF or the Darvos people. They're delusional, Andy. They are delusional, in my opinion. They are totally delusional. They think we live in a monetary world. They think that, that that's all there is. Do they think they're going to live forever? I mean, What's the purpose of sh- of shuffling off people because they don't have money? No, but that's why the narrative against Russia and China uh, is there because the 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 whole uh, multipolar BRICS um, uh, hub I- I evolves from there, and unless they can take it down, they're they're finished. They're screwed because you can't. It's the sound of one hand clapping. You cannot. You <laughs> you cannot. You cannot possibly um, battle against a, 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 the global South who has control of pretty much all of the commodities. 85% of everything that is produced in some form or another is in those, in, is in that BRICS net, uh, sort of network. So why? Of course they fear it. They fear it because then they will be a part of the system. They need the dollar. They need the hegemony of the dollar and, and, and the hegemony of, of the oceans and the hegemony of everything else to, to make sure. And they can't because suddenly you've got military powers popping up like China, Russia, that, uh, uh, and other powers as well, as well as the monetary side of things. You know, so really, if you're going to escape, escape that, their, their net, that's what's happening. That's why they're so vehemently attacking everything that attacks them, which is a multipolar world. And unfortunately, that's where we're headed. And I do hope your book, I really do hope your book um, is, 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 is going to educate people on, into that. But, but, but I have, you know, you start, let me, let me just end by, by just asking you a question. Am I right to be worried about J.P. Morgan and 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 shorting gold? I mean, seriously, I I, I don't know. I, I you know, you're the one that outed them. I know that. I can answer. Um, you mean the very same um, bank that was labeled a criminal uh, enterprise by the D- Department of Justice? Um, yes, I'm. T- yes, I can mention them. Yes, <laughs> the one that you pointed out. Yes, it was our evidence. And- 
was our evidence. And and the thing is, is is that here's the answer to that though, is is that every single first tier bank that I interact with, all our liquidity providers absolutely attest to this, are long physical gold for their own book. What they're not long on is Fed is as agent banks. They act as agent banks for the Fed. Now the Fed is guaranteeing them to pay their losses. So when so really when you look at the open interest situation on the COT report and you see, oh, the swap dealers, producer merchants, oh, look at them. They've got massive short positions. Sorry, but most of those are hedged long in the over the counter since Basel three in the over the counter physically backed markets. The, the Fed isn't stupid. I mean, they are they are on the wrong side of this, but they're not stupid. So, so essentially, every first, every JP Morgan and every other bank, HSBC, every bank I know is doing what the BIS is, as making sure they're long physical gold for their own book, because they know there's only one price for gold, and that's much higher. But, but what you're concerned about is quite right, is that the Fed is hugely behind every single intervention. And all they but think about it, if you just think about it, they, they can write a trillion. I mean, I think it would take what 60 years to count to a trillion or something, but but yeah, yeah, no, they can it's unbelievably print a trillion like that. And they'll just bail out. They'll just bail out that position. But they will have to revalue their, their $42 gold, uh, their 8,133 tons of gold that is rehypothecated. They will have to value that to market because they're the only central bank that is short gold. And ultimately, what China and Russia and everyone's doing, and as this BRICS new gold currency will do, is to really force a revaluation of gold across the whole spectrum. And uh, it's only this, the, the Fed who is left holding the bag. And they have to comply, because you can't keep pushing on a paper string, because that's all you're trying to do to stop this so I wouldn't worry about it. I think it, they can just print the money to bail out these agent banks who are operating on their behalf. But these banks are all long their own. It's just going to mean massive inflation. I mean, it will mean massive inflation. I mean, they're just going to have to put all this money on the books of their bank, right? Right. I mean, that would be. Yeah. It's what, what's crazy is that China's trying to save us from ourselves right now. They are really, I, I, I really believe this. I mean, maybe I'll turn out to be totally crazy, but they want to take away our last weapon, which is our control over Taiwan semiconductor. If they can take that away, I, I think they believe, I mean, it doesn't matter to them. I mean, they know that they can force Taiwan semiconductor to send them, sell them chips. In fact, I think they're probably already in their supercomputers. I mean, I think this is probably an open secret. What, are they going to deny it? China, if they want a chip because of some country with with not the weaponry to defend them is over the, you know, somewhere thousands of miles away. No, of course not. doesn't make any sense. It'd be totally stupid. But um, I think that if we could show the U.S., I mean, if China can show the U.S., that if people of the world that, you know, really believe in this can show the U.S., you have no ability to sanction anymore. Your last weapon is gone. Then they may cooperate. In other words, China, rather than being a monster, I mean, I can see why people want to call it. Like I said, I could never live there, but they're not monsters. They, they, they are if anything, the opposite. They're trying to save us from ourselves. I really believe that they want us to join. Why wouldn't they want us to join? They look at our 250 year history that they'll say the last 50 years were, you know, an anomaly and that we could get back. And that getting back would make us very, very much a contributor, but in a cooperative way. I mean, the Chinese and Americans wrote so many articles together. They're gone. We don't write articles with the Chinese anymore. The Chinese have lost. And we, I think, have probably lost more, but say it's equal. China recognizes that. They recognize the contribution we can make. All we, I mean, it's so crazy. Like I'm saying, they won't believe what, 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 what is going on in, in, in a history book 500 years from now. What will we'll go down is just idiots. I, I don't know what other word it is to, to use. Just, yeah. 
ungrateful, delusional people. I mean, Stephen, this has been, to me, this has been such a buzz. I, I, I mean, I feel privileged to have um, these kind of conversations with you. Uh, and uh, as I say, it, it's, they, they go very deep. And um, obviously, it, it, if we were sitting together now with a glass of, of wine, I'm sure we could, we, many hours could get past in, in, yes. in uh, fruitful discussion. Yeah, no, you're saying the same. I mean, we, we, we basically share, I mean, we, we, you're talking about green and, and the money, follow the money. Yes. I mean, you, you're totally right. I mean, you, you said it much more succinctly than I did, but I mean, I, 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 I take a thousand words to say, you know, what you say, follow the money, three words. That's it. And if you take that too. <laughs> Bless you, Stephen. Bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Andy. I really, really enjoyed it. Have a wonderful day. I'm sorry. I hope you're not late for dinner. I know I kept you. No, you know, not at all. Like, <laughs> not at all. No, this is this is food. This is food for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Andrew McGuire and Dr. Stephen Lieb, for another fascinating discussion. And remember, buy physical and make sure it's one to one. It's got to be backed one to one. And understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper, gold and silver markets, and the actual physical gold and silver markets, they're not the same, and don't be fooled. So there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another episode of Live from the Vault. Now, please help us spread the word about this channel by hitting that like button, because it really helps out the show. Share this information, and make sure if you haven't already done so, subscribe. And if you click on that bell right there, you'll be notified as each episode goes live. And with that, we'll see you next time right here on Live from the Vault. See you then.